All right, everybody, it's uh, two minutes past the hour. I will start. Um, welcome to another month, the start of another month. Welcome to another Green Energy Series presented by Solar Oregon. In this Green Energy Series, we're going to be talking about um, ventilation, um, specifically um, different types of mechanical ventilation and when is it important. Um, and this is, you're going to find that it's important when we, as we build tighter and tighter homes, which is a very good thing for energy efficiency. Homes do not need to breathe. People need to breathe. So therefore it makes sense to build tight and then ventilate right so that the people living inside homes can have fresh air. We'll get into the details in this presentation. So Solar, Solar Oregon is a nonprofit. Um, I looked up the inception date uh, before the start of this presentation. This year, Solar Oregon will be 42 years old as a nonprofit. That's fantastic. <laughs> Solar Oregon is 10 years older than me. <laughs> um, Solar Oregon as an organization uh, works on education, outreach, and community advocacy, specifically in the area of helping people go solar and increasingly go solar with storage. Some of the activities we do is uh, we give uh, and organize solar tours. Uh, we do solarized pent campaigns and peer-to-peer -peer education like the, the webinar that we're having today. You can go to Solar Oregon's website or uh, visit this link to support our work. It's an organization with a small staff that works really hard to make all these things possible as well as many volunteers that are not on payroll, but work really hard to provide um, great things for Solar Oregon. Feel free to use the uh, features of Zoom to ask questions, um, chat, Q&A. My name is Edward Louie, and my day job, I work as a building energy efficiency research engineer at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. PNNL is one of 17 U.S. Department, Department of Energy National Labs. There I work specifically in the world area of residential energy efficiency. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm quite active. I post regularly. And uh, I'm still working on uh, finishing a off-grid, super energy efficient tiny house um, that was on the Zero Energy Tour a few years ago. Maybe uh, this year or next year, you'll find the tiny house on another zero energy uh, home tour when it's fully finished. So before we begin the presentation, I'd like to give a disclaimer that the views and content of this presentation do not necessarily reflect the position of Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, US Department of Energy, or necessarily even Solar Oregon made a best effort to convey facts and information accurately. However, you're always encouraged to do your own calculations before making any investments. So um, with this presentation, we'll begin by talking about mechanical ventilation. Why do we need it? Um, we need it because of indoor pollution. We'll talk about indoor pollutions and ways to reduce it. We will talk about when does a home need mechanical ventilation? We'll talk about the different types of mechanical ventilation, and we'll talk about how much mechanical ventilation do you need, and then how to actually measure that much, you know, the amount of mechanical ventilation. So it's not just a number on a page, but it's real world measured mechanical ventilation. Um, we'll talk about how to retrofit a home with mechanical ventilation and the cost of different uh, mechanical ventilation strategies. Then we'll end with some conclusions and we'll do a plug for the next Green Energy Series topics. So to begin, um, why do we need mechanical ventilation? As I said in the, in, in the beginning, homes are built more and more airtight to be more energy efficient. That is a very good thing. Homes do not need to breathe. People need to breathe. In fact, um, increasingly, now that we're building homes with uh, more moisture sensitive materials, when if a home breathes today, that's a very bad thing because air movement carries moisture into the wall assembly, the roof assembly, or the floor assemblies. And 
then that moisture will then has a chance of condensing onto these moisture sensitive building materials. And the result is mold and rot. So you really don't want homes to breathe today. Whereas in the back in the day, homes did not have the technologies to build to be built very airtight. Um, as you can see, like they back in the there was a day when there was not even a such thing as plywood or or in its strand board. So homes were sheathed with actual dimensional lumber. And so each strip of diagonal lumber, as you can see in the upper left photo, is a gap. Um, <laughs> and so that's a gap where air can escape or come in. So um, homes were pretty leaky back then. But um, one of the great, good things about a leaky home is that even though um, moisture can tra uh, go through that wall, and in the wintertime, that warm air from the inside has higher humidity. When it reaches the outside, it'll condense onto the cold surface and make it wet. And then similarly, if this home were to be built in a hot, humid climate, like the American Southeast, if it was to be air conditioned, then the warm, humid air will come into the wall, touch the cold surface that because the inside is air conditioned and also condense and cause a problem. But the, the reason why these older homes didn't rot to the ground was because dimensional wood is a lot less moisture sensitive. So it can get wet and the lawns doesn't stay wet for, you know, days or weeks on end. It generally doesn't rot. But the same cannot be said with plywood and oriented strand board. Um, that type of material, if it stays wet for a few days or a few weeks, it's going to swell and um, become a problem. So uh, we, we have to make homes more airtight for building durability and then, of course, for energy efficiency. So if we make homes more airtight, then the indoor emissions from the point sources, such as bathing, so you produce a lot of moisture when, uh, when taking a shower or cooking, boiling a pot of pasta, a lot of moisture gets um, created. And that moisture needs to be managed. Um, and one of the better ways of managing that moisture is through ventilation. Um, in addition, some of the, the engineered wood products I said that have resulted in homes being stronger and more uh, efficient in terms of using the, our forest products, our wood and our trees, um, they're put together of glues. And those glues off gas uh, and so that's another source of indoor um, pollution that needs to be managed. And one of the better ways to manage it is through ventilation. Um, but it's not just engineered water products in our walls. Uh, we have a lot of products that we've put into a home with furnishings that are also, you know, have some smelly things. Um, foam mattresses are pretty good. Um, zero springs, no pressure points. But... The foams have some off-gassing when you first buy them. So again, those are uh, indoor pollutants that um, need to be managed. And one of the better ways to manage them is through continuous uh, mechanical ventilation. So there are point sources of indoor pollution and diffuse sources of indoor pollution. For the point sources, uh, the best way to manage those point sources is localized capture. So like if you have a uh, in a shower, you put a bath pan right on top of the shower to capture that uh, steam at the source. Same thing in during in, when cooking, you have a range hood that captures the cooking emissions right at the source, so that they don't have to be uh, removed through a diffuse uh, uh, whole house ventilation system. Same thing with radon gas. You could, in theory, ventilate the house enough to manage radon gas, but it's a whole lot more efficient to um, have your basement or crawl space have a vapor barrier and then a sub uh, underneath the vapor barrier um, depressurization system to remove the gas uh, right at the source. So point source ventilation is important to manage uh, indoor pollution um, where you can manage it at the source and then continuous whole house uh, ventilation for managing diffuse sources of pollution. 
So um, you always need point source me uh, mechanical ventilation to uh, manage the steam from bathrooms and cooking emissions and radon if that is a problem. Whole house continuous mechanical ventilation is kind of a new thing. Um, back in the day, as I said, when homes were fairly leaky, just a natural um, infiltration, exfiltration um, just from all the leaks around the walls and the roof and the and the floor and stuff like that is enough to provide a steady stream of continuous ventilation. Uh, but now that we're building homes tighter and tighter, um, a way to measure how tight a home is is through a metric called air changes per hour when tested at 50 Pascal. And the lower right-hand picture that's all kind of red, you see a... a um, a, a skirt that has been placed into an exterior door and inside that skirt is a fan. And that fan is a calibrated uh, instrument that can measure airflow at different pressures. And so one of the standard ways of measuring a, how leaky a house is, is to depressurize the house to 50 Pascals. And a Pascal is a unit of pressure um, and it has the weight of about a postage stamp. So 50 Pascals is about 50 postage stamps um, worth of weights. Not a whole lot of pressure, but enough to be able to measure uh, air leakage. And that's at uh, that standardized depressurization, if the home uh, leaks more than uh, five air changes per hour, well, that home is leaky enough that it's not super necessary to have um, a mechanical ventilation system installed to um, help keep the home ventilated so that the people living in it uh, stay healthy. Um, but many new homes being built for energy efficiency and building durability purposes um, are below five air changes per hour. Um, and in theory, all homes that are um, newly constructed should be below five because that is the building code um, currently, Oregon has um, a modified building code where um, you're supposed to build to five, but um, there is not necessarily a requirement to test the home to verify it's below five. Um, and the reason why is because of some politics. Um, and the main kind of argument for not requiring testing is that in rural parts of Oregon, um, small towns, eastern Oregon, etc., there are simply not people with the equipment and the skills to perform this test um, in all parts of Oregon. And so therefore it cannot be mandated as a statewide requirement, uh, which, which is a decent uh, argument for not requiring it. Um, but uh, yeah, in theory, the home should be uh, five air changes per hour, which means that really they should have mechanical ventilation. Um, one of the things in the later in the presentation that we'll get into is that uh, the mechanical ventilation that's installed needs to actually work and not just be there for decoration. Um, and so we'll talk about you know methods for measuring it and commissioning it, and we'll get there. So there are really four types of uh, whole home mechanical ventilation. Um, there's the supply type. Um, an exhaust type, a balance type, and an entry recovery type. Um, and we'll get into the pros and cons of the different types. Well, supply only. This is a system where often it uses the um, blower motor inside uh, your, the, your home's uh, furnace, air conditioning, central air handler system to, um, and it, there's a pipe that they add to the return side. So when the air handler is sucking air um, in from the air home to return that air to be reconditioned, it can also suck some of the air from this pipe that's connected to the outside um, to provide some uh, fresh air that's mixed in with the, um, uh, the return air from the house. Uh, the good thing is that this air, you can point to where the air is coming from, from the outside of the house. So the source air is known. It can't be filtered. And of course, since it goes through your air, air handler, it is conditioned before delivery. 
Um, and since it's integrated with the um, central air handling system of the house, the duct system, uh, the distribution of the um, ventilation air is quite good and evenly distributed. Um, of course, there are some disadvantages to this is that, well, if it's sucking air from the outside, but there's not necessarily a controlled way of um, replacing that, uh, removing that air, then you're, pressure, you're, you're essentially you're pressurizing the inside of your house. And that can be a problem because uh, when you're pressurizing a house, then the indoor moisture inside the in indoor air, which is typically much higher than outside, uh, especially in the winter time, that can be pushed into the walls. Um, and they, once it's inside the wall, it can find the coldest surface, which is uh, the cold sheathing, so OSB or plywood, and condense onto that surface. And as I said, the OSB and plywood are moisture sensitive materials. So that could cause some mold and rot problems. Um, and this is not energy recovery. So um, it, the cold in the wintertime, that cold air coming in requires a decent amount of energy to uh, warm up. And so the air handler is using energy to warm up that air. And then that pressurization, you're pushing warm conditioned air uh, into the walls and then it disappears through the cracks of the house. So, um, you know, it's not super energy efficient, but hey, it works. You're getting some fresh air. Um, and just a plug. So like if your home is newer than about 2015, there's a chance that you might have this style of mechanical ventilation system. Um, one of the ways, again, is to tell is to go look at your air handler and see if you find some sort of motorized damper that looks like the picture in the lower uh, right-hand corner. And then look around the air handler. You might find some box that has some labeling uh, for um, and ventilation controller. And maybe you might also find along that path a box that has a little tiny handle on it. It may not be labeled, but it might look like that. And if you slide or lift a flap or something like that, or lift a latch, there might be an air filter inside. So um, I've seen hundreds of homes that have mechanical ventilation systems in, in the Portland area. Some of them have this, but almost none of them are labeled to tell the homeowner that they need to check the filter and replace the filter. So just a note, these are pictures and then go to your around your house and look for something like this if you think you might have it. Okay, so exhaust only mechanical ventilation. This is another fairly popular uh, way of providing mechanical ventilation because, well, it's the cheapest way to do it for the builder. Um, and it's fairly low operating cost. It's lower on operating cost compared to the, the supply only method because think about it this way. In the swing season, like right now, you know, we're neither in a really heavy heating or cooling season. It's kind of mild every day. In order to get mechanical ventilation, you need to operate that big giant fan that's in your air handler. And that big giant fan uses a lot of energy. Comparatively, a bath fan is a much smaller fan that uses a lot less energy. So that's why it's uh, lower in operating cost. Um, but a mechanical ventilation that's exhaust um, only has the problem of depressurizing the home. And so then the makeup air that is providing the ventilation well, that's not coming from any particular point source. It's coming from all over the house. Um, sometimes that air is coming from the attic. Other times it's coming from the garage. Other times it's coming from the crawl space. Other times it's coming from the cracks in the walls. Uh, and so this air is not, is not um, filtered. It's not conditioned. Um, and it's not necessarily clean. So um, the air quality of this vet, you know, ventilated air is not exactly great. Um, and then of course, there's also the potential chance of drawing moisture um, into the wall cavity. Um, this is really a particular problem in warm, humid climates, um, like the American Southeast, Florida, 
North Carolina, that kind of area, where if you draw that air from the outside and suck it into the wall, then you're air conditioning the inside of the house and the outside air is super hot and humid and so that it condenses inside the wall. In Oregon, this type of mechanical ventilation was quite common and our climate zone, it's fairly safe because we don't have super hot, humid air in the summertime. Um, but uh, one of the dangers of this mechanical ventilation system is that it can contribute to backdrafting of combustion appliances that have a naturally that require a naturally uh, ventilated stack to um, remove the combustion byproducts. Um, you can literally like suck the um, the smoke down the chimney, so to speak. Um, and so it's not great uh, if a home has these types of combustion appliances. Um, one of the common ways of doing this type of mechanical ventilation is a uh, bath fan that is, you know, smarter than average. So like what I'm showing here in the lower picture is a bath fan that has a mechanical ventilation controller. So like the first big dial here with the word CFM, you can adjust that dial to speed up and slow down the fan to um, get the correct like CFM you need. And then um, if you turn it down to the lowest setting, um, like, and it's still too much for the home, then what you can do is you can adjust the timer from 60 down to like 30 or something or 20 so that it only runs 30 minutes per hour or 20 minutes per hour. And that's another way to try to reduce the amount of ventilation um, that this exhaust fan, uh, bath fan is providing. And we'll have a future slide where we talk about how to actually calculate the amount of me mechanical ventilation you need. Um, so that will become clear where you end up deciding what CFM you need. Okay, so now we're getting into something that's better, which is balanced mechanical ventilation. And as of April 1st, 21, this now is the minimum allowable mechanical ventilation in Oregon, in new construction. So like the previous slides where you have only exhaust or only supply, those two methods are no longer allowed. Um, and from the cons that I was talking about, you can kind of see why that maybe they're not the best uh, mechanical ventilation strategy. Um, balance is good because um, you're not depressurizing or pressurizing the building. So then you're having a lot less um, risk of moisture going inside wall cavities and floor cavities and stuff and causing problems. But before where you only had the supply equipment, only the exhaust equipment, now you need both. So this system is now more expensive um, and it's more complex to install. There's more wires that need to be uh, connected to each other to um, uh, interlock the two exhaust and the supply uh, fans together. Um, and therefore, because it's more complex, uh, it's even harder to commission correctly. Um, and again, you're bringing in outdoor air and then you're exhausting it to uh, the uh, same amount of air volume to the outside. That warm, that air, outdoor air, if it has a lot of humidity, um, your, your home is gonna gain humidity. And then if the air outside is very dry, your house is going to lose humidity. So it's not a method that actually provides um, good humidity control. Um, but uh, if your home has one of these mechanical ventilation systems, again, I encourage you to go look for the equipment uh, and check to see if it's working. Um, there is a YouTube video um, right here. If you search like Honeywell W8150, a video to show like how it should be wired. Um, and then you can check to see if you, if you have one of these controllers, whether it's actually wired correctly and whether it's turned on and whether it works. Um, because you'd be surprised. A lot of these um, are, when, when this became a requirement, the industry was not necessarily magically trained on how to install the stuff correctly. So um, there's a good chance that some of them are not installed correctly. Um, so it's now you have a video, so you can go check it yourself. Um, here's two diagrams on how this balanced mechanical ventilation 
could be implemented. Um, to the left-hand photo, there is a photo of how to set it up if your home has a central uh, ducted system. But if your home has, let's say, one or more ductless heat pumps, so your home has no ducts, um, how do you do this? Well, they're showing that, yeah, you have a, a fan that brings in uh, fresh air, and then you can hook up either your kitchen range or your bath, one of your bath fans to this controller so that they can sync up together um, and then um, deliver the balanced mechanical ventilation that way. So that's also allowed. All right, so energy recovery ventilation. This is the best way to do it because um, what these devices have is a core that um, will be able to recapture the, 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 the heat from the outgoing stream of air to use that heat to condition the stream of air coming in. Um, so in the winter time, you're, the air that you're exhausting to the outside is quite warm compared to the inside air. So then the heat leaving the house will be using used to preheat the cold air coming in from the outside. And then in the summertime, the air exhausting from the house is quite cold. So that will, this energy recovery ventilator will free cool the hot air coming from the outside. Um, very cool uh, piece of equipment. Um, it saves energy over its lifetime. And um, this heat exchanger is uh, kind of porous. So it's kind of like uh, the material, it's a type of plastic, but um, essentially has the porosity of like paper or napkins. Um, so therefore moisture can transfer through the layers. And so then how what that works is that then it maintains whatever level of humidity the inside uh, of the, your house is. And so that's a very good thing because as I said, like in the winter time, uh, the cold outdoor air is very dry. Um, and so you're losing humidity. And then if you live in the American Southwest, then the air coming into your house is very humid. And so then it, it adds humidity to your house. So an ERV being able to that, do that tra moisture transfer um, helps main, man, uh, maintain the level of humidity in your house. Um, but uh, this type of equipment is uh, more expensive than just fans to pull air in and fans to blow air out. So um, there is an upfront cost uh, penalty associated with this. Uh, but uh, what later in the slide, I'll show you that the cost delta between like the supply, the exhaust, or the balanced versus the energy recovery ventilator, it's it's actually not that bad. I mean, uh, back in the day before there were like tons of choices in the world of ERVs, you only had the expensive ERVs you could choose from. But now there's tons of ERVs on the market, and the price of ERVs are really not that bad. So you'll see that, and I think you'll you'll be pretty happy. So how much mechanical ventilation do you need? Well, um, the kind of the standard for point source exhaust for managing uh, shower steam and stuff is 50 CFM or greater. Um, and then for kitchen range hoods, it's 100 CFM or greater for every 10,000 BTU of stovetop. So an average stovetop has in, you add up all the burners, is around 25,000 BTUs, maybe 30,000. Um, so therefore, you need about 250 to 300 CFM of range hood uh, exhaust capability to um, manage uh, the emissions from the day you decide to cook a big meal and run multiple burners at the same time. So how much whole home mechanical ventilation do you need? Well, that's kind of complicated. Um, it's based on uh, where the your home is located. It's based on the size of your home. It's based on the number of occupants or number of bedrooms. It's also based on how tall the house is because um, the taller the house, the greater the natural uh, pressure difference is from the bottom floor to the top floor. And so then there's that a tall skinny house will have uh, more natural ventilation than a single fl floor ranch style house. Um, 
And it's also based on how leaky your building envelope is, which is based on uh, a blower door test. So uh, once you kind of know these pieces of information, you can stick it into this calculator. Um, it's uh, based on a, some formulas by ASHRAE, which is the American Society of like Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, I think is what it is. Um, but uh, rather than trying to do the computation yourself, uh, there's a free app that you can go online and find. It's from uh, Red Calc ASHRAE Ventilation Calculator is what you can search, or you can use that link. Um, and it'll link to this page, and you punch in the numbers. And what it'll do is it calculates your um, required ventilation, how much um, natural ventilation your house should have based on you know its geometry and its location. And then therefore, what is the uh, remaining balance or that you need to make up with mechanical ventilation? So that's how you calculate how much mechanical ventilation you need. And then therefore, once you have that number, then you can use that to tune whichever one of the four ventilation strategies you choose uh, to deliver that much mechanical ventilation. So how do you measure real world uh, uh, CFMs? If you have an exhaust only ventilation system or you know a some uh, balanced where you have exhaust and supply, well, if you need to measure the exhaust amount. Well, how do you do that? Uh, well, there's two um, companies, TEC and Retrotech, that make a flow box for measuring exhaust. Um, I happen to have the red one by uh, Retrotech. And um, so if you're in the Portland, kind of area you can reach out to me and borrow it or um because i can show you how to use it it's fairly easy to, to uh to teach how you to, to teach you how to use it um or maybe i'll stop by for dinner or something like that and uh you know bring along and measure your uh exhaust fans um and th then you'll know um on the supply side uh, it, there's a different um piece of equipment for measuring supply air flows um, they're called flow hoods or bolometers, and that is for measuring supply air flows. Um, the reason why you need different equipment for measuring uh, exhaust versus supply is um, when your, su your supply air is a coherent airflow and an exhaust is an incoherent airflow. Um, a good way to um, think about coherent versus incoherent airflow is uh, the process of blowing out a candle. If you blow out a candle, you're blowing air from your mouth. That's coherent airflow. Um, have you ever tried to put out a candle by sucking air into your mouth? You'll find that it's nearly impossible to do. Um, but that's because when you suck air through your mouth, it's an incoherent airflow. So you can never get the airflow all coming in in one direction uh, to be able to get enough airflow to blow out that candle. So that's why there needs to be a different instrument to measure exhaust versus supply. All right, so we talked about kind of the mechanical ventilation strategies, but you know, most of us don't live in a brand new construction that has it. Uh, and so if you have an older home, it probably doesn't have mechanical ventilation. And we talked about how you need to do a blower door test to see if your house is even close to being tight enough to need mechanical ventilation. Uh, if it's super leaky, then no, you don't need it. But if you have efforted to increase the energy efficiency of the house by air sealing and adding insulation and weather stripping and stuff like that, hey, there's a chance that if you did a really good job, you might actually have successfully retrofitted your home to the point that it's tight enough of an envelope that now you need to start thinking about mechanical ventilation. Um, so what is kind of like the easy way, because obviously you're not going to like, you know, want to drill whole new holes and run new line and stuff like that. You want to do it the easiest way possible. Um, and so one of the easiest ways to do it is to um, get a spot ERV and place the spot air ERV next to the air handler's return grill, which maybe it's in the hallway, maybe it's in the living room, wherever, 
but place the spot ERV near the return grill so that whenever the air handler turns on, it will be able to suck this fresh air through the return grill and then distribute it throughout the house. And the spot ERVs deliver about 30 to 50 CFM of ventilation. It's not a whole lot, but uh, as I said in the this calculator, in an existing home, chances are you don't have a super tight envelope. So maybe like, you know, you hit 4.7, 4.8, or 4, you know? Um, so there is still infiltration credit that you're get getting because your home is not like passive house level of tightness. So then your requirement kind of ventilation is not the total amount of ventilation required because you get some of that infiltration credit. Um, so 30 to 50 CFM from this spot ERV, there's a chance that that is the, the right amount you need. So um, this is a good way to do it. Um, so, and then we'll get into the cost, the cost of the different mechanical ventilation. Um, as I said, exhaust is, was the cheapest for the builder to install. Yes, it is the cheapest. Um, a bath fan that has um, that speed control dial and stuff, it's about $214. Um, so it's cheaper than anything on the list. Um, supply, that uh, Honeywell controller with the damper and stuff, about $275. Um, so as you can see now with the 2021 Oregon code for code change for mechanical ventilation, like I said, now you cannot do supply only or exhaust only. Now you need both. So you add up the exhaust and supply strategy together. Well, you're basically at the same cost as a spot ERV now. So um, you're not going with an ERV is no longer a higher cost um, option. Uh, unless you need a, unless that spot ERV, which can only do about 30 to 50 CFM. If you build a new house and it's a big new house and it's, pretty tight so therefore you need more than 30 to 50 cfm of ventilation then um the exhaust and the supply like this exhaust fan can do up to like 100 cfm and the supply easily can do 100 cfm so then you might need two spot ervs in order to meet that house's needs well in that case then uh you know if you do two ervs that's double the cost of doing a supply and a exhaust um, method, which only adds up to about like $500. Okay. So, and the other reason why, even if, if you want to say, oh, I don't want two spot ERVs. I just want a bigger ERV. Well, the bigger, bigger ERVs are not necessarily cheaper than two spot ERVs. Um, you know, these bigger ERVs are like a thousand, thirteen hundred dollars and stuff. Um, so yeah, for, for builders, um, there may be still some builders that are interested in that, you know, balanced supply exhaust method because it, you know, saves them, what, $500 or $800 and stuff. You know, builders will want to save like every dollar they can. So, um, yeah. Uh, but these numbers are really quite good because like um, until a few years ago, like some of the more when people talk ERVs, they were talking zender ervs you know from germany and those ervs are five thousand to ten thousand dollars um to install um basically at the price point where like if you have to ask how much it is you might not be able to afford it <laughs> um but uh now much more affordable ervs have come in come on the market uh so they're not getting a high quality erv is not within not out of reach to the average person now so uh, if you are going to get an ERV, um, which is the best out of the four uh, mechanical ventilation strategies, then it behooves you to get a good one. Um, and a good one is one that can do 75% uh, or greater sensible heat recovery. And if you look carefully on this, uh, what's it called? Um, product um, screen here the ones that can do only 67% efficiency versus one that can do 75% efficiency. I mean, the, the price is like almost no difference. So 
what I'm trying to say is like picking a good one doesn't necessarily mean that you have to pay more. Um, it could be that you're paying the same amount. You just have to like be conscientious on which one you pick. Range hoods, again, if you're gonna go to uh, if you're gonna get a new range hood, maybe because the one you have you don't want to have a range hood, or maybe the one you have only recirculates air, so it's not even exhausting outside. So um, you, you want a new range hood, then it behooves you to again pick a good one. And certain range hoods have better capture efficiency than others. So like if you get a range hood that moves 250 or 300 CFM, but it's not good at capturing the actual cooking emissions, then, you know, it's just sucking air from the rest of the house and throwing it outside, you know, the air that you need to use your HVAC to reheat or recool. Um, the whole point of a range hood is try to remove the cooking emissions. And so if you want to pick a good one, pick one that's above, that is installed above the range or the cooktop. Do not pick a microwave integrated range hood. There are no good microwave integrated range hoods in existence. So you pick a dedicated range hood and you pick one that looks like an upside down like bowl. It's got some edges on the side and an edge in the front and stuff like that. So that, you know, like if you were to think like logically how to actually capture emissions, like an upside down kind of bowl or upside down like uh, Tupperware container. It, that's the kind of shape you want. Um, the industry has all these so-called like aesthetically pleasing range hoods that don't have that shape. Uh, resist the temptation to you know pick the good-looking one that doesn't have that shape, and think like a scientist. Like you're buying a range hood not so that it looks super pretty and is the center of your kitchen. You buy a range hood so that it effectively removes the cooking emissions. So like pick one that like logically makes sense in terms of its shape. Um, for bath fans, um. Almost every bath fan on the market uh, will will meet that 50 CFM requirement. Uh, but some nice features to have are ones that have a humidity sensor. So you can turn it on and not necessarily need to remember to turn it off. Uh, once it removes all the um, steam from the sh a shower, it'll turn itself off. Um, they don't really cost that much more than a bath fan with no humidity sensor. So maybe if you're going to you know upgrade or install a new bath fan for a bathroom that doesn't have one uh pick one of a humidity sensor um so those are some pieces of advice that i have um and so some conclusions is uh it's really the best way to you know uh, do ventilation is to minimize the amount of ventilation you need um like if you're gonna do tons of like smelly things in your house, generate tons of indoor air pollution, smoke, bring in, you know, all the uh, smelly furniture, um, then you need more ventilation. Uh, so reducing sources of indoor pollution when possible is good. And then um, as we saw in this presentation, when the build tight, ventilate right was the title of this presentation, but ventilate right, it kind of falls on a spectrum. Um, some are more right than others. Um, <laughs> and like there, there are homes with kitchen range hoods that don't even exhaust to the outside. So I don't consider that ventilate right. So, you know, uh, same thing with there are older homes where like the bath fan does not even exhaust the outside, it exhausts to like the attic. And so therefore it's blowing the moisture into the insulation or blowing the moisture against like a piece of wood in the attic. Um, that's not uncommon. So um, ventilate right is also something you need to check. Um, and so the correct amount of general mechanical ventilation um, is important mainly for new homes because a lot of existing homes are just not tight enough to need mechanical ventilation. But hey, maybe the audience here is, you know, like me who works kind of hard to uh, weatherize their own home. So Maybe you have a home that actually is tight enough. Uh, and so the one, one of the ways you know is with a blower door test to measure the home's uh, air changes per hour at 50 pascals. 
So then you know whether you're in the category of needing mechanical ventilation or not. If you do, then uh, use the Red Calc's free ventilation calculator to calculate the correct amount of ventilation um, you need. And then if you go select a mechanical ventilation method, then um, as you saw in the price sheet, doing the best one, which is the energy recovery um, method, is maybe only slightly more expensive than any other option. Like it's not that big of a price difference anymore. Uh, but energy recovery ventilation saves energy throughout its lifetime. So um, it's worth it. Um, cleaning and maintenance of mechanical ventilation equipment is important. So like, again, like for the supply type, see if there is a um, little like eight inch by eight inch or 10 inch by 10 inch little filter slot somewhere. And if there is, see if there's a filter in there. And if there is, maybe you just discovered it and it has never been changed. So it might be really dirty. Um, and same thing with continuous um, exhaust based mechanical ventilation. Well, that fan, if it's like, even if it's the, a bath fan, if it's running like almost 24 seven, it's gonna collect dust. Uh, so like, you know, pull down that plastic grill um, and vacuum it and then look inside to see if you need to like put in a vacuum attachment and vacuum the inside some more. Um, and then uh, all the energy recovery ventilation devices, they have filters inside them. So you also need to know where those filters are and periodically check them. So I recommend checking those filters like three or four times a year. Um, at minimum two times a year. So like, you know, at each major change in season. Um, and then uh, in order to kind of evaluate the home in terms of whether you are you need mechanical ventilation. And then if you have, if you want to pay somebody to check all those ventilation systems, to make sure they actually are moving air and not just a noise machine or decoration, um, then there are tests that can be done. As I said, blower door testing or using a bolometer or an exhaust flow flux to measure supply and exhaust based ventilation. Um, getting somebody to come into your home to kind of do a comprehensive test of these systems is um, around 750 to a thousand dollars. But you only really need to do it once in your life. So it might be worth it, you know, find a year with a really good tax return or something like that and spend some of that money on, <laughs> on building testing, I guess. Um, so those are kind of my conclusions. And I want to put a plug in for the kind of the next green energy series and then also the solar winery tour, which is May 4th. Um, look for emails and Facebook posts and stuff to sign up. And then uh, the next green energy series uh, will be uh, June 1st. Um, and the title of that is going to be Building Resilient Communities, uh, Community Microgrids. Um, I look. I won't be presenting that one, but I look forward to co-hosting it and uh, learning from our presenter. Um, July six, there's a presentation on making solar affordable via peer-to-peer -peer loans. So if that's a presentation um, related to a peer-to-peer -peer loan program called Seeds for the Soul. Um, it's been around for a long time. It's a really cool program. And then uh, August third, there's a presentation about. Uh, a unique PV system that is PV plus thermal. Um, and I don't know anything about how that system works, but it sounds really interesting to get both photovoltaic electricity and thermal energy coming off of this, this system. And uh, I look forward to um, learning about how that one works. So that's what we have. And uh, there's some time for questions. Okay, let's see. And we have one question about inducted ERV is noisy. Do they have a sound rating? Yes, um, every piece of equipment has a uh, sound or DB rating. Um, most of them are, the rating is very quiet. So if yours is noisy, chances are it's because the duct system is um, not, installed well or designed well. So like there's a really tight turn um, in it that causes air to like, you know, become very turbulent around that turn. 
or there's a restriction. And so therefore, like the system has to work really hard to push the error through. So um, um, my suggestion is to uh, trace those ducts and look for that sharp bend or a restriction and see if you can uh, locate it and then uh, fix it and then see if that quiets down your uh, ducted ERV. Um, why is Zender so expensive? What is uh, the difference between HRV and ERV? So Zender is really expensive because it is like the Mercedes Benz or the Cadillac of ERV um, equipment. So it has a really, really high um, uh, heat transfer efficiency. So like um, I was saying, like we want to target at minimum a 75% sensible recovery efficiency. Zenders are like in the 90%. Uh, so it's very good. But uh, will you ever save enough energy between the 75% versus a 90 plus percent one uh, to cover the cost difference between a, a Zender and a cheaper ducted ERV or even a spot ERV? Um, probably not. <laughs> um, the difference between an ERV and an HRV. So ERVs um, are a device that is an enthalpy. They, we call it energy heat recovery, but really its true name is enthalpy recovery ventilation. So ERVs will balance the moisture. So it'll help maintain moisture um, of the indoor air. HRVs are heat recovery ventilators, and so they only recover heat. They do not recover um, the humidity. And so the difference is that like in the uh, heat transfer core, as, as I said, uh, the heat enthalpy or energy recovery ventilators, the different pleats of that heat recovery um, has the porosity of kind of like a napkin um, so that moisture from the two air paths can transfer over. The, in a heat recovery ventilator, HRV, those pleats are moisture impermeable. So it's only heat transfer. And so um, in the winter time, you could be drying out the air of your inside of your house. And then if you live in a hot, humid climate, you could be increasing the humidity of your house using an HRV. Uh, for most of the US, um, Climate regions and ERV is the way to go. And that's also true for um, Portland, Oregon, Seattle, so on and so forth. Um, there could be an argument that you, if you live in like multifamily uh, housing where, you know, it's high density, you know, small square footage and you have like four people living in a small space that you want to actually uh, have a system that doesn't maintain humidity but attempts to try to remove humidity but again like a hrv is not a dehumidifier it's if the outdoor indoor air conditions um happenstance to result in a reduction a net reduction in um indoor moisture then it will happen but if those conditions are not true an hrv will do nothing to um reduce uh indoor humidity so um, don't ever think an HRV is a dehumidifier. It is not. Uh, so uh, in our climate re region, it's, you know, I think it's uh, the best to try to maintain indoor humidity. Um, and therefore, an ERV is better. Um, and then uh, do you have a contractor list? Preferably one who deals both with making our home more airtight and adding ventilation where if needed. Um, I don't have a contractor list, but, um, I would think a company like perhaps like green savers, um, that does multiple trades in one under one company would have the capabilities of doing something like that. Um, earth advantage is another company that, um, might do building test that I know for sure they do building testing. I'm not sure whether they'll install an ERV for you, um, Maybe they will, or maybe they have a best friend that they know that can do the install and then they'll just do the testing part. So Earth Advantage is another company to uh, um, to consider. Um, those are the ones that come off of the top of my head. Um, uh, I would suggest, you know, asking around or 
looking at Google to see what you find. Um, unfortunately, I, I I don't have a I'm not the best resource for those types of things because like um, as you see, I I have a lot of the building testing equipment myself, and I'm handy enough to install this stuff. <laughs> so I I don't need a contractor to 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 get involved. Um, okay, and then uh, Jeff, I think I also answered your question about ERV uh, being um, better here in the Willamette Valley. Okay, so that's Q&A. Uh, chat, let's see if there's anything in the chat. Um, Earth Manager Green Savers, okay. All right, well, I think I've answered all the questions. Are there more questions that, uh, that anybody happens to have? We'll give people another minute to pose another question. Uh, if not, then uh, let's just finish with this slide to remind folks of upcoming events. Thanks, Edward, for another great talk. And everybody, I hope you're telling your friends about these. The recording will be up in a few days, and everybody who's registered will get a link to the recording on the Solar Oregon YouTube channel. And we we'll look forward to, to June 1st for the next one. Right, and I will be going to the solar winery tour. So I look forward to seeing some of you who are going on the winery tour. Have fun on that. Thank you. Okay, super. Okay.